More impeachment outrage in D.C. This time with a witness. Is Donald Trump in trouble? Michelle Obama. She has found more racism in America. Or did she? And finally, mansplaining. Apparently, it doesn't only happen here in America. All that's coming up right now on I'm Right. Uh-oh, Donald Trump is in trouble again. This is the end of the world. I mean, you've seen all the headlines for the past 24 hours. We apparently had a new witness who was on the call between President Trump and Ukraine Zelensky. Now, this witness, what was he witness to? I'll tell you what, we'll come right back to that. What does this piece of paper say? You see it? See what it says? We all read that, right? It's right there in black and white. How many witnesses would you say we need to help us read what it says on there, interpret what it says on there? Should we call two, three? Do we even need one? Should we call 80? You see what I'm getting at here? How much longer do we have to go through this charade about what was said in the call? What did he say in the call? What did Donald Trump say in the call? We have a transcript of the phone call. It's not a mystery. I don't need a witness. I don't care if he's a lieutenant colonel, a major, Air Force. I don't care if he's the smartest man on the face of the planet. Uh, yes, I went to community college, but I can read. I know what was said in the call because I can read. It's written down in black and white. I don't need new witnesses. I don't need help. I can read a piece of paper. I know what was said in the phone call. But. If we're going to talk about the witness, then let us talk about the witness for just a moment. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Well, he had some interesting things to say about why he chose to come forward about the phone call. First thing he had to say was, I was concerned by the call. I did not think it was proper to demand that a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen. And I was worried about the implications for the U.S. government's support of Ukraine. Hmm. That's funny. I was worried, and I was this, and I was that. Hmm. He had more to say, by the way. I realized that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the Bidens and Burisma, it would likely be interpreted as a partisan play, which would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing the bipartisan support it has thus far maintained. That would all undermine U.S. national security. Hmm. I, I, I realized, I did, I was concerned. Well, here's the thing. United States foreign policy is not set by a lieutenant colonel. It's not set by a general. It's not set by you. It's not set by me, although it probably should be set by me. The United States foreign policy is set by the president of the United States. If a lieutenant colonel on the NSC is concerned, guess how much that matters? Not at all. Sit back and shut up or resign and quit. You are not the president of the United States of America. And no, I am not one of these people that's going to watch him walk up there as he did in full military uniform and be like, well, we, we certainly can't criticize that guy. He's a lieutenant colonel. Don't say a word about Vindman. He served. Did you serve? Don't let them do that to you. Don't you ever let the left do that to you. They do this all the time. Well, you can't criticize him. He's a veteran. You can't criticize her. She's a woman. But don't say that about Ihan Omar. Did you know she's a Muslim? What, Greta Thunberg? Yes, she wants to destroy your way of life, but you better not talk about her. She's only a child. The left wouldn't give a crap about Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman's service if he was up there carrying a right-wing message. I promise you that. He only gets the special veteran protection because he's going after Donald Trump. It doesn't matter that he's concerned and what his worries are. That doesn't matter at all. That's not his role. His role is to do what Donald Trump wants him to do, period. And again, I circle clear back to this in the beginning. I don't need special witness testimony from somebody for something I can read for myself. It's right there. Well, I have the transcript. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. I've read it. Or even if you think it's a big deal, your interpretation of it doesn't matter. I don't need something interpreted to me that's in plain English. 
But you'll get this from people. Well, it's not a transcript. It was only Donald Trump's version of a transcript. They left out key parts. He cut out the, it's a nefarious scheme. Things have been cut out of it. Well, let's examine that for a moment. Is that what happened? Is that what Alexander Vindman said? Ooh, apparently not. Greg Miller from Washington Post said, and I quote, officials described the discrepancies cited by Vindman as minimal and of limited significance to investigators. Even Vindman didn't ascribe any sinister motive or effect to the changes he sought that were not incorporated into the document. Hmm. So he said there were discrepancies, none of them were significant. Which brings me back to my original point. We have a transcript of the phone call. Stop trying to squeeze blood out of an onion, Democrats. There's nothing there. It doesn't matter if you call 10,000 witnesses to interpret the transcript I've already read for myself. There is nothing there. But this is what the party has become. The party has become the impeachment party. 100% committed to impeachment. 100% com committed to impeachment all the time. Here's Liz Cheney talking about it. But I would just note that what the Democrats are now trying to do, they've basically uh, cooked up a process they've been conducting in secret. The, ga the goal of the process, the aim of the process, uh, was very clearly to preclude the president's counsel from asking questions of witnesses. The goal of their process was to preclude uh, Republicans from being able to call any witnesses. Uh, and they've now taken this process, they've gotten so much pressure because of the way they've been conducting the process. They're now attempting to sort of put a cloak of legitimacy around this process uh, by saying they're going to bring it to a vote on the floor. They can't fix it. The process is broken. It's tainted. Uh, they have gone through this process where you have seen one side of the story. It's been an effort to get one side of facts and then to selectively leak those facts in order to taint the president. And we're not going to participate in, in helping them attempt to provide uh, legitimacy to that process. Uh, it really is shameful what the Democrats have been doing in terms of attempting to try to impeach a sitting president in the basement of the Capitol. She's right. And I want you to pay attention to what she said. You know what you've seen over the past week or two? Closed door meetings. Republicans aren't invited. Well, why wouldn't they invite Republicans? Why is all this so hush hush? Because there's nothing there. If they had some humongous bombshell that was going to take Trump down, do you think Democrats would be hiding such a thing? Does that make sense to you? They're hiding, they're being so hush-hush about it, they're selectively leaking because they don't have anything significant. You don't have to be some Trump super fan to see that. And on that note as well, and I'm gonna be, say this as nicely as I can possibly say it, how big of a chump do you have to be to believe that this is real? To believe that this is what's going to take down Donald Trump? You've been lied to for three years now about impeachment and collusion, and this is the end of the world, and this is the beginning of the end. And three years you've been lied to. I have some sympathy for someone who believes a lie the first time, second time, third time, fourth time, maybe fifth time. Hey, man, you just, you just want to believe the best in other people. That's fine. At some point in time, though, you're just a useless sucker if you still believe this stuff that comes out of Washington, D.C. Stop telling me impeachment's coming. Stop telling me a, a collusion. A, a Donald Trump's about to be thrown. Show me. Show me. Let's see it. And on that note, you heard Liz Cheney talking about uh, they're going to have a vote now. We'll see what happens with the vote now. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is supposedly going to have an, a vote on, an official vote on the impeachment inquiry this Thursday. Well, we'll see about that. She already has vulnerable Democrats, one in New Jersey already, saying, ah, yeah, I'm not voting for that. That's, that's going to be a no. You see, Nancy Pelosi is stuck between a rock and a hard place. She needs to eventually has to have to, she has to have this vote. She does. But if she has the vote and it fails, that looks awful. What's she going to do? What's she doing right now? Right now, she's doing what we call whipping votes. Behind the scenes, she's burning up the phones with every single one of these congressmen, calling them into her office, threatening them, bribing them, doing whatever she has to do to make sure that these people will vote her way on this impeachment inquiry. 
Now, let's say she gets it done because Nancy Pelosi's been doing this a while, right? I mean, she's been in Washington, oh, about 8,000 years. Do you think that's actually a win for Democrats? Do you? Do you know how presidents get elected in the United States of America? I've got some bad news for you in some of your states. See, I live in the great state of Texas, and I have to break it to you. We're not going to decide the next president. All you commies in California, you're not going to decide the next president. The presidency is decided by about five or six swing states. Everyone knows which way Texas is going to go. Everyone knows which way California is going to go. And do you know what the swing states, we already have poll numbers, do you know what the swing states think about this impeachment stuff the Democrats are doing? It's not good. They're polling places like Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida, North Carolina. Do any of those states sound important to you? Yeah, those are the states that decide elections. They think this impeachment stuff is insane nonsense. Now, why do they think that? It's not because they're all Trump super fans. That's simply not realistic. You cannot do something. It's not possible to do something. You can't talk the American people into something being a big deal. You may be able to win some people over, but you can scream impeachment 9,000 times a day until the day you die. This is impeachable. I'm telling you it's impeachable. No, it's impeachable. No, this, is, this isn't normal. The American people decided for themselves immediately when they heard about it, whether they cared or not. And look, they don't care. You can't make them care. Now, how should you handle it? I suggest you handle it the exact same way Donald Trump appears to be handling it, and that's pretty nonchalant. Here's what Donald Trump had to say about it. But this one turned out to be incredible, all because they didn't know that I had a transcript done by very, very talented people, word for word, comma for comma, done by people that do it for a living. I, we had an exact transcript. And when we produced that transcript, they died. Because you look at the whistleblower statement, and it's vicious, vicious. And that vi whistleblower, there's no question in my mind that some bad things have gone on, and I think we'll get to the bottom of it. I think it's going to be a total reversal. But I've lived with this. I've lived with this cloud now for almost three years. He has? Three years. Handle it like Donald Trump is handling it. Whether you love him or hate him, that's how you handle it. It's been three years of this. Put up or shut up time. The Democrats do not have impeachment. They don't have it. Even if they were to pass the impeachment inquiry, that's not filing articles of impeachment. You then have to go through all the committee hearings and then vote on the articles of impeachment. What they're planning on doing is running out the clock on this thing. They're going to drag this on and have a new outrage cycle every day. Two months from now, mark my words, we'll be talking about the next person who got hauled in front of Congress. And, and all the talking heads will be telling you, this is the end. Ah a very damaging day for Donald Trump. Come on. No, it's not. There's nothing there. The American people know there's nothing there. What is there that you should be worried about? If there is anything, you should be worried about the fact that an O5 in the Army, a lieutenant colonel in the Army, can hear the President of the United States making foreign policy decisions and think to himself, you know what? I don't like that. Somebody needs to be notified. Bro, there are employees and there are employers. Guess which one you are. All that may have made you uncomfortable, but I'm right. Coming up next, our resident expert on the swing states and the one who actually has her ears to the ground, Washington Examiner Selena Zito. Hang on. Well, you heard all my wisdom about swing states this and swing states that, and obviously everything I said is right. <laughs> That's why we named the show I'm Right. But I don't want you to just take my word for it. Let us bring in our resident expert on the swing states, author of The Great Revolt and columnist for The Washington Examiner, my friend Selena Zito. Selena, I'm hearing that the, the swing states, the people who are back to work, I'm hearing they don't care about the transcript of a call between Trump and Ukraine, a country they can't even find on the map. What are you hearing? Um, I'm hearing, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's always a joy, Jesse. 
you know, I, I've spent, a, I just got back from 10 days on the road. Uh, this is not a subject that is an obsession with, with voters in swing states. Uh, here's the number one reason is, uh, I believe the headline was the day after Trump was inaugurated when the Washington Post said that um, now the impeachment starts. This has been hinted at, thrown at, you know, um, talked about, and been sort of the known truth of Washington forever. And voters have, for the most part, tuned it out because they have tuned out their appreciation for expertise among political strategists, academics, and sort of the swamp creatures on both the left and right um, who believe they know better than everyone else. And that's on sort of all subject matters, right? That's just not on impeachment, but in particular on impeachment. I can't stand these know-it-alls who think they're the smartest people in the world. Total narcissists. Now, is it really fatigue, Selena, or is it just they don't really care that the president would swap something like that with Ukraine? I mean, I understand there's going to be fatigue because every night they get home. These are, again, working people. Get home, family, kids, school, homework, turn on the news for 10 minutes. What's the newest outrage? And all they see is impeachment for three years. They roll their eyes and move on. So I get that fatigue is part of it. But is it also part of it that, I mean, look, you can like it or hate it, all, with all due respect to my Ukrainian fans, of which I'm sure there are many, people don't care about Ukraine. And they certainly don't care that Trump may have brought up something with the leader of Ukraine, and the leader of Ukraine said nothing bad happened, and Trump said nothing bad happened, and wh why am I supposed to care about Ukraine when I'm back to work? Well, uh, you know, there, there's a couple of different layers of problems here um, in that it's not that people don't care about Ukraine. It's just that they understood who this guy was, whether they voted for him or not. You know, I mean, he's a three-time married, playboy dating, um, Howard Stern regular, um, who is doesn't mind breaking all the glass in the China Bowl. He was always going to do things differently. That's one layer of it. The other layer is something I hear a lot in that they people say to me a lot, look, all right, I get that the press is hard on him. What I don't get is why weren't they hard, this hard on the last guy? So it, it's, it's, a, it's a different level of what about ism. It's a, it's a keen awareness that he is treated differently than the last president. And it is not sort of... Uh, fleshed out that he's also going to approach things differently. I, I'm glad you brought that up because there's obviously a certain amount of Trump being Trump that is baked in the cake, as you just basically told us. That I mean, voters are not, I mean, it's not going to blow them away that Trump dropped an F-bomb on a phone call. They're, they just assume yeah. that that's going to happen. That's not going to move the needle with anybody at all. Is this, in your opinion, because you have much more of a pulse on the voters than I do, I really only worry about myself, is this the way forward? Is this how voters are going to be going forward? Or is this unique to only Trump because maybe he serves their purposes? Maybe they, maybe they like his charisma. Do you think voters in the United States of America, especially in the swing states, have changed? And now it's just, look, I don't care how many times you were married. I don't care what you do here. I don't care what you do there. Just make sure I have a job and stay out of my life. Is that a new attitude or is that unique to Trump? Yeah, um, actually, this attitude has been building long before Trump. Uh, he is sort of the result of it. He's not the cause of it. And uh, these sort of measuring sticks that Washington has u have used in the past have all just sort of been blown apart. And I think this is, for the time being, I would, su I would suggest for at least the next generation that this conservative populist coalition is not going to have the same sort of... Um, list of what is and isn't appropriate as long as the person is doing their best to do what is best for the country. And, and I think that that's where we are right now. And I don't see it changing, at least for a generation. I mean, we also live in a cancel culture, right? So no. I, I think, you know, people are very tired of, of you know, 
not being able to say anything. And so they embrace someone who doesn't care what he says. You just spent 10 days on the road, shifting gears just a little bit here. And there was a congresswoman from California, Katie Hill, got caught up in a bunch of personal stuff. I never covered it on the show because I don't care about it. I'm only bringing it up now because I don't care about it. And I wanted to know, did you hear her name out there with the resignation? Because honestly, yes, I'm, I hear she's, she's out there with a bunch of dumb stuff. She did a bunch of horrible things, whatever. I honestly don't care if she was doing heroin on the House floor on top of a Nazi flag, playing a game of Twister with everybody else. As long as you're out of my life and leaving me alone, I don't give a crap. Is that Does it apply to Katie Hill or is that just Donald Trump? No, you're absolutely right. People were not talking about Katie Hill. Again, it's sort of that those two different worlds that we exist in, Jesse. The one where we, you know, go home and we we put the the device aside. Um, it, it, that's something that was an obsession in on Twitter, as is most odd things that people don't talk about. Uh, and and honestly, people don't also talk about the president's um, every, every word that he utters. It's not an obsession with them. They knew they were picking a guy who was on tele our televisions for 30 years and in the public eye for 40 years. They knew exactly the cat they brought, um, th they picked. Uh, so yeah, b on both things, they're not talking about everything that Donald Trump utters. They also aren't talking about Katie Hill's interesting life. I want to talk real quick about manufacturing jobs because you travel manufacturing job country and you get all this disconnected information out there all the time. But we hear that a lot of manufacturing jobs are back now. Manufacturing jobs are leaving. Now they're back. They're leaving. And you can't seem to get a straight scoop from anybody out there. Is the feeling amongst manufacturing job com uh, country that they're back, that, that manufacturing is at least somewhat back? Or is the feeling of, hey, where are these manufacturing jobs we were promised? Oh, no, no. They're, they're having a hard time filling the jobs. And there are, I, when I was in Michigan and Wisconsin and Iowa and Minnesota and Ohio and Pennsylvania, there are hiring signs everywhere. Well, here's the problem we are facing, and it just broke this afternoon. A uh, petrochemical company wants to move to locate uh, to Pittsburgh thousands of jobs, manufacturing jobs. The mayor of Pittsburgh, Bill Peduto, just said, I'm sorry, you're not welcome. So we're at a uh, interesting crossroads where some mayors uh, will make the decision to be ideologues rather than doing the best thing for their uh, for their constituencies and and, and middle class jobs. But no, there are a lot of jobs out here. They're having the, the biggest complaint I hear from employers and from from people who work in manufacturing is we can't get enough good people to to apply. Now, I need you to unpack that for me because I grew up when I was a kid about 45 minutes from Pittsburgh. And I mean, look, they call them the Pittsburgh Steelers for a reason. That's steel town. That's manufacturing town. I don't think they're a bunch of right wingers. It's still a city, so it's probably going to be Democrat run. But how can a mayor, ideologue or not, possibly think he can survive reelection by running out manufacturing jobs? Or has Pittsburgh changed? And I'm just crazy now. Wait a minute. You just buried the lead. You grew up 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Toronto, Ohio, right along the Ohio oh, River exactly with power right. plants and every. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Why do you think I'm so smart and handsome? Right there on the Ohio River. I had no idea. This is this is a fascinating development. <laughs> well, um, back I, to the mayor. Here's here's why nobody's challenging to do that. No one's challenging for his, him for his job. I suspect that's going to change. The Labor Council just came out against him strongly for making this ideological decision. And he's a Democrat, Darren Kelly, firefighter, head of the Labor Council. Take a look at my Twitter feed. He just shot him. In, I mean, the gloves are off. All right. How can people find you, not just on Twitter, but, I mean, apparently you write for every, every publication in America. You wrote The Great Revolt. I've already told everybody it's the best political book I've read in forever because you were the only one who was right about the last election. Where can people get more, Selena? 
And The Great Revolt's coming out in paperback next week, which has an update from 2018 and well, what to look for in 2020. Go to my website, selenazito.com, S-A-L-E-N-A-Z-I-T-O. You can uh, check out what, uh, what I've been writing. Oh, and sign up for my emails. It's free, and it's not that thing, and it's fun. I will be looking for my free signed copy of the new version as well. Selena Zito, thank you very much, ma'am. Thanks for having me. Coming right up, Michelle Obama. She's discovered that America's still racist. Do white people really not want to live with black people? And if that's the case, can it be explained? Hang on. Well, there are a lot of things I miss in life. I miss waking up in the morning and having a bowl of Captain Crunch cereal for breakfast. I miss trading baseball cards. I even miss my crappy first car, the 1983 Honda Accord that I used to drive all over town, bought it myself, completely full of pride. I miss some things, but one thing I most definitely do not miss was eight years of being scolded and lectured by Barack and Michelle Obama about how crappy I was and about how crappy America is. My goodness, that was the absolute worst. Well, Michelle Obama, you know, uh, former first lady who now luxuriates in a $14 million mansion on Martha's Vineyard, has stepped up and she had this to say about where we are right now with race relations in America. You know, I want to remind white folks that y'all were running, running from us, <laughs> you know, because this family, this family, yeah. <laughs> this family <laughs> with all the values that you read about, yeah. you were running from us and you still running <laughs> because we're no different than the immigrant families that are moving in, the families in Pilsen, the, the, the families that are coming from other places to try to do better. Yeah. But because we can so easily wash over who we really were because of the color of our skin, you know, because of the, the texture of our hair, mm -hmm. you know, that's what divides countries. Artificially as well. Artificial things that don't even touch on the values that people bring to life. Oh, gosh. Is there anything more painful than being scolded by that? <laughs> okay, let's unpack this for a moment. This is a woman who luxuriates on yachts, on mansions. She's not flying commercial. She's not, she, that's funny, I, I missed her on the Southwest Airlines flight I was on this morning. You know why? Because she's on Learjets, flying all over the world. This is a woman who, who has achieved the pinnacle of success. She wants for nothing. Her husband was elected president of the United States twice. Boy, that's some racist country, isn't it? Now, why is she like this? A couple things. You have to understand that money and success don't necessarily change how you were raised and who you are. I don't know her childhood. I don't know her parents. I don't care to. But I will tell you one thing. That is who Michelle Obama has always been. For whatever reason, from a very young age, she decided or someone decided for her that America was some racist dump and that there was some horrible, oppressive thing happening to her and other people. And no amount of success she can achieve will change her mind on that. She's been like this forever. She'll be like that forever. Let's be honest. When you step out of your $14 million mansion in Martha's Vineyard, surrounded by white people, by the way, and you lecture the rest of America that they don't want to live around black people, that's somebody lacking in self-awareness so much, they're never going to get it. But back to her youth, this was from her Princeton master's thesis. This is a direct quote from Michelle Obama. My experiences at Princeton have made me far more aware of my blackness than ever before. I have found that at Princeton, no matter how liberal and open-minded some of my white professors and classmates try to be toward me, I sometimes feel like a visitor on campus, as if I really don't belong. Regardless of the circumstances under which I interact with whites at Princeton, it, of at Princeton, I mean, it often seems as if to them I will always be black first and a student second. Let me see if I can explain that. She's at Princeton University talking about how oppressed she is. She's not at a cafe down south in the 50s being told she has to drink at a different drinking fountain. 
She's on campus getting her master's degree at Princeton University, and Michelle Obama looks around, and all she sees is black and white. All she sees is racism. That's a terrible way to live your life. You can't change Michelle Obama's mind. We can make fun of her a little bit and, and blow her off, and we should, but you can't change somebody like that's mind. But what you can do is make dang sure you don't ever let bitterness fill you up like that, and make sure you don't do that to your children. Even if there is injustice everywhere, wherever you are, don't put that on your kids. Because look at her. Does that look like a happy woman? Does she seem content, surrounded by champagne and caviar? Yachts? Does that seem like a pleasant human being? That's somebody who will have grievances until the day she dies. And ladies and gentlemen, it is better to be flat, broke, and busted than to be full of bitterness for your whole life. But let's unpack what she said there for a minute. Y'all ran away from us, and white people were still leaving black people. It is human nature for people to want to live, work, and worship around people who look and think like them. Do you know what they have like in a place like LA? To, th to this day, they have little Tokyo. They have little Armenia. They have all these, di little, they have little Chinatown. They have all these different areas where people of a certain color or certain ethnic group or certain religion gather. That is what has always been done in the United States of America as well. You've seen all the immigrant stories of them coming into the United States of America. And where did all the Italians go? Little, little, little Italy. Where did all the Irish go? Little Ireland. That is the nature of man. But here in the United States of America, I would argue we've actually broken that to a certain extent. Now, it'll never go away completely. But here in this country, you know what I see everywhere I go? I see people gathering mainly for their socioeconomic status, not their skin color. You see, I live in a normal suburban neighborhood outside of Houston, Texas. You know what I'm surrounded by? Black people, Asian people, Hispanic people, white people. But you know what we all have in common? We all make roughly the same amount of money. You know the first thing you do, whether you're white, black, brown, yellow, purple, you know the first thing you do when you make some money and you're in a big city? You get out. You go to where the good schools are. You go to where the roads are fine. You go to where there are more cops and life is better and there's 4th of July celebrations and ice cream and fireworks. Money, capitalism is what has broken so many racial divides in the United States of America. And instead of doing what the Obamas did for eight years and picking at the scab and picking at the scab, why don't we take a look at it and say, you know what? We're doing all right here. We really are doing all right here. Contrary to what the Obamas would have you believe. Contrary to what Barack Obama scolded us all about for eight years. Going abroad, apologizing for us, telling everybody America's racist. You remember if I had a son, he'd look like Trayvon. Stop with that nonsense. It was no accident we had racial incident after racial incident after racial incident under President Barack Obama. And what have we had under President Donald Trump? Race hoax, race hoax. Race hoax, race hoax, race hoax. Starting to wonder who the racist is. To talk about that, to talk about impeachment, to talk about mansplaining, we are bringing on the one, the only, the great Buck Sexton of the Buck Sexton Show, which you can watch right here on the first. Hang on one sec. Welcome back to The Great I'm Right with Jesse Kelly. And now we are joined by fellow host on the first host of the Buck Sexton Show, my friend Buck Sexton. Buck, I wake up this morning to a headline from Michelle Obama telling me that America is still racist and that white people are still leaving black people. And, that, and Buck, I've got to tell you, how many black people are living next to Michelle Obama in Martha's Vineyard? Uh, well, Jesse, look, I, I think with the Obamas, something that's, uh, that's pretty, you know, you have to keep in mind is, you know, going forward here is, the Obamas are the single most formidable brand in American uh, Democrat politics. And so, you know, when you're talking about Michelle Obama saying these things about white flight from these areas, I do feel like we often forget that Barack Obama was president for eight years, and there has been a tremendous amount of progress in this country, stretching back since before you and I grew up. I mean, if you're asking me about Martha's Vineyard, I, you know, yeah, I, I don't know how 
diverse. There are some areas of Martha's Vineyard where there's some diversity, but not a whole lot going on there. Um, but there is always a sense with the with Democrats in general, the Obamas more specifically, that we're all being kind of lectured, and that hasn't changed. I see. It, it has not changed. It's absolutely insufferable. And I, look, I, I don't want to just focus on the Obamas because it's not just her. I just saw a headline, I believe it was from CBS. Serena Williams is teaching her daughter and speaking out about how women are financially abused in America. Serena Williams is worth $180 million. Nobody's been less financially abused in history. Somebody please abuse me financially like that. What is this commitment from so many people? You see it from LeBron James, the Obamas. Serena, you see it from people all the time. When did we get to a place in America where people just wanted to be a victim? They could achieve the pinnacle of success. And instead of saying, look at what I achieved, work hard and you can do the same. Instead, they try to relate by being like, hey, you know, I'm oppressed too. Yeah, well, victimhood status is something that a lot of people aspire to, even those who are at the very top of the professional and financial world in this country. Uh, and, and, you know, it's just amazing to see that uh, some of the old lies as well about uh, oppression of, of women based on wages continues on. It doesn't, it doesn't matter how many studies you have that show that, uh, you know, that equal pay in the context of women being underpaid. Look, Jesse, if you're running a business and you could pay people 20% less to work for your business to get the same work, don't you think you'd give that a shot? You'd only hire women, in fact, if that were true. If it was, it was really as simple as just women are paid less because of, of sexism. But as to why people like to aspire for this victimhood status, I think part of it is just that they want to seem like they're in keeping with what they're supposed to say, right? I mean, if you're worth $100 million or a billion dollars and, you, and you're a female and you say, oh my gosh, it's so hard, you know, women are not getting equal pay, everyone claps for you and says you're amazing. If you say, well, I mean, I'm kind of rich and a big deal and, you know, if you work hard and some things go your way, even as a woman, you can do just fine in America, people look at you like there's something wrong with you. They look at you like you're a problem which I don't understand because I tell people what a big deal I am all the time and everybody loves me. I don't get it. But anyway, back to impeachment. Now, this Vindman thing, I, fa I find it to be honestly bizarre and there's not much that really surprises me, Bob, but we have the transcript. We have the black and white transcript. And then the leftists wanted to come out and say, well, it's not a full transcript. It was edited and Vindman knows what was edited. And then Vindman came right out during the testimony and said, uh, yeah, I mean, there are, there are a couple minor things missing, but nothing that changes anything. We have what was in it, and we're now d pretending as if 10 more witnesses will somehow change what's in it. I, I really feel like, and maybe I'm crazy here, I feel like the Democrats are trying to force the American people to care about something they don't give a crap about. Well, first, Jesse, let me just say, I sorry, I look like I just woke up from a nap at the beach, so let me just take care of that for a second. Uh, I had to <laughs> fix the hair there. Uh, and then I didn't want to say anything. Yeah, as for uh, this lieutenant colonel and what he's what he's testified about, uh, I think that this is a leak, by the way, that, that, that he had to change information. And, you know, this is another time when only stuff gets out of these hearings that, as we know, also Democrats can determine what questions get answered. Not only who gets asked questions, who the witnesses are, but what questions get answered. But the stuff that comes out of it is always bad for Trump, always good for the anti-Trump narrative, which is not a coincidence, as you and I both know. I think this is just they've realized, because people like you and me are running around saying, we know what was said, we have the transcript. I don't care, you could have anybody, you could have, you know, name your expert, the, the ghost of Winston Churchill could appear to tell me that the, uh, the phone call here was really, really bad. And I'd say, well, I know what was said in the phone call. I don't need someone else to explain to me what my judgment on that should be. I think the reason that you have uh, this lieutenant colonel coming out to say that there might have been different stuff on the phone is to undermine that defense of, well, we know what was said. Oh, now it's, oh, no, but you don't really know what was said. But I think we do. Does this impeachment vote go down Thursday? I mean, they're teasing it, Nancy Pelosi. I feel like they're finally, they shamed her into, well, we're going to have a vote now. We're having to vote. And immediately you have do uh, vulnerable Democrats coming out saying, uh, uh, that's going to be a no for me. Do you think she does it? Because eventually she has to have the vote, 
but she can't afford politically to lose the vote? How does she handle... So I, I believe that she has done, honestly, as much as it kills me to uh, compliment her, I believe she's done the best she can trying to juggle all those flaming things at once, and she's running out of time at some point. Uh, yeah, I think that the problem that Nancy Pelosi has is that right now they've got a procedure here that if they were to say, okay, now it's legitimate, or if they have this vote on, on what the process, if they essentially uh, formally open an impeachment, right now they have this impeachment inquiry. So they've opened a process to look at whether they should open a process. It's a, it's a little bit circular and bizarre, but that, that's what they've done. So if Pelosi were to hold this, this vote, then it's, okay, well, what has been going on before this? And it, this whole thing just looks ridiculous because quite honestly, it is ridiculous. The poll that I want to see, by the way, is not whether or not you know Democrats or Republicans want to see Trump impeached. I want to know whether Americans really think that this whole impeachment inquiry thing is even vaguely interesting. I know in the news media, we have to talk about it every day. I just keep looking at this like, so we're going to have another, another person coming forward to tell us another story about this phone call that from the beginning, I've been like, okay, so what? We're gonna, this is going to be every day now for the next two months? I don't know if I can handle it, Jesse. No, it is. It, it's funny you brought that up because I just asked Selena Zito about that because she does, you know, all the swing state tours and things like that. I, I didn't see, I don't see people in the Rust Belt who are back to work. Look, and I'm not insulting anybody because to be honest, I couldn't do this either. I don't see them even knowing where Ukraine is exactly. They know the general region, but you're asking people to give a crap about Ukraine. And Americans in general, look, we're like anyone else. They don't necessarily care about a country across the ocean that doesn't affect us. You're, you're trying to break down the minutia of a call between Trump and the head of Ukraine. And it's over there. I mean, it's next to Russia somewhere, I think. And what did he do? He asked for a favor, but he did. Uh, OK, wh whatever. You're, I mean, nobody, nobody who's remotely unbiased is going to look at this situation and be like, oh, yeah, we got to toss him out of office. I think so. And, and I, I wonder when I, a lot of journalists, look, they, they actually run businesses that are almost like artistic enterprises where they have a really wealthy patron, whether it's, you know, Bezos or Carlos Slim for a while for the New York Times. I mean, there have been all these cases of these elite media outlets. And we keep thinking, well, they give the people what they want. No, not really, actually. Some of these places would be out of business. Uh, you know, CNN would be in a whole lot of trouble if it didn't have CNN International. So if it hadn't established itself as a global news brand that could trash America to the rest of the world to amuse the rest of the world at America's expense, you know, these are businesses that would be in trouble. I just bring this up because I think that journalists never really learn the lesson about maybe care about what Americans care about. Instead, they care about what journalists care about. And unfortunately, if we're on the analyst side of things, as you and I are, you know, we're not running around begging people uh, around Capitol Hill for interviews every day. I mean, I've done that too, but, you know, that's not our job, thank God. Uh, the truth is, we end up having to talk about this at some level because this is what all the journal, this is what all the news stories are about. And if you're analyzing what's in the news, you look at all the front pages, you say, okay, well, I guess we have to talk about this. It's just fundamentally not very interesting. I mean, the story doesn't get better the more they tell it. And we've reached a point now with this Ukraine phone call where I've heard the same story now a thousand times. And and they, t it's almost like it's a ghost story. And they think that if they have more enthusiasm for it, ooh, it'll be scary. No, it doesn't get scarier. I don't care. That's right, Buck. People ask you and me for interviews. We don't ask other people. That's how that works Correct. now. The, the, the game has changed, baby. All right, but we're going to hold Buck on for just one second because I saw an ugly video from across the pond that we need to get his reaction for in our last segment. Hang on one second. We are back on I'm Right, and we still have our favorite guest, Buck Sexton, host of the Buck Sexton Show. I wanted to hold him on because I wanted to get his take on what I saw as being really, really nasty mansplaining from across the pond. Go ahead and roll it. Because Jonathan's got a vision, which I agree with, but in order to pay for that, we need the money. And to get the money in, we need to stop 1 Brexit. 1 or 2 percent of GDP yeah. isn't going to make a difference. Right, we're going to be Let Maria much, speak. Much Let Maria so speak. Stop man's Climate planning. change is, is, you know, <laughs> if you are describing Jeremy Corbyn as business as usual, then you haven't been reading the newspapers or watching the television. He was green before the Greens existed. He rode a bike. He's got an allotment. <laughs> he will do both. He will bring social justice <clears throat> and a green revolution. So have the vision on the Greens, but vote Labour 
if you really want it, it to it's happen. It's got to be more than allotment, and let's just look at the facts. In 2017, John, there was 14... John, could you stop mansplaining? There was this is the I'm first day of the election, Adam. and Adam has and asked me to respond, and if you continue to mansplain, I'll have to complain. Please don't resort now. to sexism <laughs> when we're trying to have a conversation well, about the facts. Well, could you stop mansplaining? Yeah. I've asked you three times. <laughs> <laughs> can, we, can we get her at the next Democrat debate, by the way? Just every time Joe Biden opens his mouth, like, can you stop mansplaining? Stop, oh, stop your God. mansplaining. I mean, how do you argue with that? The funniest part of that, Buck, is honestly, the, the first time, uh, you're actually the one who sent me that video clip. And oh, yeah. on my life, when you sent it to me, I thought that that was a skit, like an SNL skit or a Mad TV. A, I don't know if they still do Mad TV skit. I thought that was a skit. That is a real person. People like that honestly exist in this world today. How miserable is that human being? Well, it's like, you just sit here, and if someone said something you don't like, Jesse, you say, excuse me, stop mansplaining. Your, your mansplaining's out of control, all right? No crumpets, no tea for you if you continue to mansplain like that. It's fantastic. Well, talk about a mic drop. Slogan. You just say no mansplaining. I mean, the truth is, though, if she were talking to you, she'd have to say no more Jesse splaining, which is a whole level beyond mansplaining. Oh, it's, it gets way worse from there, lady. We need to invite her on the show. All right, Buck, I want to thank you for mansplaining to us tonight. And uh, thank you, you have a good me. one, sir. We'll be talking to you again real soon. Thanks, brother. That is all for the night's version of I'm Right. I hope you all enjoyed hearing it as much as I enjoyed telling it. And let's be honest, I know you did. See you tomorrow.